In all my years of ministry, I will never forget this one young woman I met. She was a teenager. Uh, she came from a good, faithful family. Her family was not well off, but she was always incredibly joyful. And around her freshman year in high school, she found herself pregnant at 13 years old. And she was immediately faced with the decision that would change the course of her entire life. People gossiped about her, they spread rumors, they accused her of terrible things, but she held her head up high, she kept that baby, and she devoted her life to being the best mother that she possibly could. Despite all of the cultural pressure to think of herself, she chose life. Her name is Mary, specifically the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, and we'll be talking about her in today's episode, but you can read the full version of that story in the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. It begins around Luke chapter 1, verse 26. But I want you to take a moment to think about how crazy that is. You know, Mary was the age of betrothal, so around that time, from anywhere from 12 to 15 years old, a teenage girl already legally betrothed, legally married to Joseph. And this would, she would be assumed guilty of the crime of adultery if she went through with this and Joseph wasn't on her side, which was a crime punishable by death. Uh, but an angel appears to her and says, you're going to give birth to the Son of the Most High, God himself. And she says, yes. What? <laughs> like, first of all, if an angel appeared in my house, I don't know what I would do. But then that, that life-altering question. This is why Mary is called the first and greatest disciple. She was the first person to say yes and give herself, her whole life, completely to Jesus Christ. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. We call this her yes, her fiat is what it's called. A fiat in Latin means let it be done or may it be done. The words that come out of her mouth, the actual yes. This is why we honor Mary. As Catholics, we do not worship Mary. We do not pray directly to her, but we ask her to pray for us. Now, this can sometimes be criticized or misinterpreted by others, especially other Christians, but even by Catholics who sometimes treat Mary like she is a god or like a talisman for good luck or something, which is not right. Our job as Christians, think of it this way, is to be like Christ. So Christ followed the Ten Commandments, right? And the fourth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother. Uh, today, when this, uh, this video originally premieres, is the Feast of the Holy Family. And so this is also why we honor and revere St. Joseph. I mean, if you think about it, uh, you live with the two only uh, perfect people that have ever existed. So who's always to blame? Poor Joseph. Um, but Joseph, he has no recorded words spoken in Scripture. He was silently serving, and he was trusted by God with the task of caring for and leading these two people. That's deserving of honor. And we also honor Mary as Jesus did. He honored his father and his mother. And so we want to do what he did and honor them as well. But not only that, when Jesus was on the cross, he gave Mary to us as our mother. It says in John chapter 19, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took him took her into his home. This disciple whom Jesus loved is, is John, but he writes about himself, calls himself this title, I think, to show that this is a symbol for all of us. We are all disciples who Jesus loves, and so we're all called to take Mary into our homes and into our hearts. She teaches us perfect relationship with God in each of his three persons. So think about it. She was the perfectly trusting and obedient daughter of God the Father, she was the perfectly devoted and sacrificial mother to God the Son, and she was the perfectly receptive and open spouse to the Holy Spirit. Mary, uh, many priests actually say, um, the ones who serve as exorcists particularly, they report that there is no one that the devil and the demons hate more than Mary. Why is that? Well, it's because she was a perfect human. You know, she was not like Jesus, who was also God, but was completely, in, you know, um, human. But she was only human, completely and only human. And she never fell victim to any attack, temptation, or obstacle that the devil tried. 
So if you ever feel like you're overcome by darkness, I know many of us have probably felt that in the midst of this year, I invite you to turn to Mary and ask her to pray for you. Pray a Hail Mary, pray a Hail Holy Kareen, uh, learn the Rosary, uh, a devotion to Mary. Uh, pray a Novena, a series of prayers for nine days asking for Mary's intercession. Or even consider a consecration where you offer yourself to Jesus through Mary, through studying how different saints and the church has understood Mary and have a better relationship with Jesus, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, by her example. Do those things and your life will begin to be radically transformed. In fact, it was St. Francis who once said that there are two ladders to get to heaven. One is a red ladder and one is a white ladder. The red ladder is the one that's taken by all of our prayers, sacrifices, fasting, almsgiving, our acts of service, all the things we do to slowly become more and more disciplined followers of Jesus. And these things are all great. They take a lot of work, effort, time, discipline. But the white ladder is simply through Mary. Both of them will get us there. But one is far easier if we are willing to have that same radical surrender and yes that Mary had, which is no easy task, but she can serve as that example. So what do we believe about Mary? As Catholics, we have what's called the four Marian dogmas, four things that all Catholics are bound to believe about Mary as infallible church teaching. The first one of those is her immaculate conception. It says in Luke chapter one, coming to her, the angel said, hail favored one, the Lord is with you. Now it says later that she was greatly troubled by this because that original Greek, hail favored one, is kare ke karatomene, which means it's like past conditional. So one who has previously been filled with grace is what it means. And this is where we get the words, hail Mary, full of grace, the beginning of the hail Mary, um, the Lord is with you. And so she's troubled by this because the angel's telling her, you were preserved with grace before this. And that you know, she doesn't maybe necessarily understand that, but we do now as Catholics because of church tradition, we know that God preserved her from the stain of original sin. So that if she was going to bring into the world the perfect uh, embodiment of God in Jesus Christ, her womb, her body, she also had to be perfect and untainted by original sin. This is why Mary is sometimes called the new Eve. Think about it, Eve, Adam and Eve from Genesis, she was also born without sin. She had free will, but she chose to disobey God uh, and sin entered the world. Mary was also born without sin. She also had free will, but she chose to obey God. And through her, the undoing of our sins, our salvation comes to us in the person of Jesus. So that's why it's so important that we have her Immaculate Conception, which we celebrate every year as a holy day of obligation on December 8th. The second Marian dogma is that she is the mother of God. Now this took a while in the church to kind of understand because they really had to make sure they understood like Jesus is divine. He is God himself. And if Mary was his mother, well then obviously she is the mother of God. Now they were trying to figure out, well, did God kind of, you know, imbue his divine essence to Jesus later? And when they realized like, no, Jesus was always divine, always human, then Mary naturally undertook this title of the mother of God. And the title that she has in Greek is Theotokos. And it's Greek or Latin, I think. Uh, but that means God bearer. This is why another one of her nicknames is the new Ark of the Covenant. So if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, or if you've read the Old Testament, you know what I'm talking about. The Ark was this, um, I don't know, an object, a, a big vessel that carried around um, the Ten Commandments, the manna, the bread from the desert when they were wandering in the desert, and the staff of Aaron, the first priest. And the last we see it in, um, in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah is sealing it up into a cave. Well, who was born into a stable cave but Jesus? He is the law, Ten Commandments. He is the Word made flesh. He is the bread of life, manna in the desert. And he is the high priest, the staff of Aaron. He represents all of those things. And to this day, the ark has never been found. In fact, if you read in Revelation uh, chapters 11 through 12, the last verse and first verse of those chapters respectively, there's this moment where it says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of the covenant could be seen in the temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a violent hailstorm. A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman 
clothed with the sun, with a moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Now we as Catholics understand that that is Mary. The third um, Marian dogma is her perpetual virginity. Mary says to the angel in chapter 1, How can this be since I have no relations with a man? And we believe as Catholics that, yes, she had not, um, she had remained a virgin up until that time, but she also remained a virgin for the rest of her life. Now, you do see elsewhere in Scripture where we have the brothers of Jesus mentioned, but the word there in Greek is the word adelphoi, which actually means relative. It can mean cousins or children, even maybe from a previous marriage of Joseph. And what's interesting is they uh, are often seen in the occasional times they're mentioned as trying to influence Jesus or tell him what to do. That would be very inappropriate for a younger sibling to do in that culture. So it implies that they are older and either from a previous marriage of Joseph or older cousins. And so we believe that Mary retained that fact, um, that characteristic for the rest of her life. And the last Marian dogma is that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven, the assumption of Mary into heaven. We also celebrate this as a holy day of obligation, a feast day on August 15th every year. Um, Mary's body has never been found. No one has ever claimed to have her remains or relics from her body. I mean, there are relics from apostles all over the place. People dispute about who has the right ones. Same things with pieces of the true cross of Jesus, his, his crown of thorns, all those things. But no one, no one reports to have any relic of Mary, of her body. It has been believed and circulated as a matter of church tradition since as early as the third century and preserved in many Christian historical documents and writings of early church fathers and historians that she was brought up into heaven, body and soul, and that one or many of the apostles witnessed that. One rumored account says that St. Timothy himself, the parish where this ministry comes from, uh, was one of those original witnesses. Now she is in heaven where she reigns as queen of the saints. But remember, we do not worship her like we would maybe an earthly queen or, you know, bow down to an earthly queen. Uh, we do not pray even to her directly. We ask for her intercession. So the same way I would ask my wife or my friend to pray for me, I ask Mary. But we honor her a little higher than the honor we give to any other human being or any of the saints. We actually have different words in church teaching for our attitude and our disposition toward all those who are in heaven. So, for instance, the honor we give to all those in heaven who are the saints, especially those canonized saints like St. Saint Francis, St. Saint Mother Teresa, um, they are examples for us on how to live holy lives. The word for that is dulia, which means honor. To Mary, we give the highest honor because she is our mother and the mother of Jesus, and so we call that hyperdulia, or highest honor. But the praise we give to God and God alone is something totally different. It's called latria, which means praise. So we don't praise and worship anyone, any of the saints, Mary. We only praise and worship Jesus. But we recognize in their example and in their proximity to Jesus in heaven that they can pray for us. They know what it takes to live a holy life. And so we look to them for an example. Mary's actually appeared countless times in what are called Marian apparitions all over the world. When she does, she often appears to children, the oppressed, the lowly, the forgotten, uh, the same people her son ministered to. And when she appears, she also appears to look like them. So Our Lady of China was a Chinese blessed mother. Our Lady of Cabejo in um, Rwanda was a African-American uh, or African blessed mother. Uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, when she appeared in Mexico, she appeared to Juan Diego in uh, a native appearance. She always appears to people as they are. And that apparition actually of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we recently celebrated the feast day on December 12th. Um, the tilma, which is the, um, I don't know what you call it, the piece of clothing, uh, the fabric that the image was miraculously imprinted on, has some very interesting qualities to kind of show the supernatural reality that is going on here. It always measures at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, just like a human body even though it's just an image. Um, a stethoscope listening to the waistline of the image will actually reveal a rhythm of a fetal heartbeat, which is around 115 beats per minute. The colors and the images of the uh, on the tilma, they cannot be reproduced by modern standards or technology. They have no idea how they were made, where they came from, um, and the actual image isn't even printed on the fibers themselves. If you look microscopically, it's actually kind of hovering or floating above the fibers of the tilma. And tilmas themselves, these were, I think, um, 
pieces of clothing that were made of cactus fibers, they were very brittle and they deteriorated pretty quickly. Usually by like 10 to 15 years, they were they're completely gone. This one has lasted 500 years with almost no efforts or ability to scientifically preserve it until probably the modern era. And it reminds me of one of my favorite verses in the Gospel of Luke in this account where Gabriel appears to Mary and it says, for nothing will be impossible for God. Absolutely nothing is impossible for God. You know, Mary teaches us that no matter what we think the risk, dangers, consequences, or anxieties might be, saying yes to Jesus will always have miraculous results in your life. Your small daily yes to Jesus is what will make you the saint you were created to be. Impossible things can become possible. Whatever choices you make, whatever vocation you feel called to, always say yes to Jesus. And you'll find your fulfillment, your mission, and your purpose there. It doesn't mean it will be easy, but it will be incredible. So how do you need to say yes to Jesus today? Look to Mary, see in her the miraculous hope that one yes contains. It can change the world. You can change the world. Simply turn to God in prayer now, today, and say yes.